Nicole Lombardo here, co-founder of Get It Done Gals, and I have Nick Pigeon with us today. Nick is a positive psychologist, a global success coach, and a Hay House author, and we are so excited to have you here today, Nick. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah. So Lindsay and I met Nick through a, a group coaching program that we were in, a mastermind program, and Nick is so incredible, such a force in the online world and just shows up as such a beautiful woman with a, a beautiful smile always on her face and has such positive energy. So we're going to dive into her journey as an entrepreneur today and really look at how she's come from having a business to going into the online world and also showing up in this way that is authentic and real on social media and and then we'll uh, dive into the nitty-gritty of how she actually gets speaking engagements and moves her business forward also we'll talk about how she became an author all right so why don't we start with your journey why don't you tell us more about your journey of how you got to where you are today so Way back 10 years ago, which makes, always makes me feel old when I say that, 10, 11 years ago, I decided that I was going to study engineering at university. I'd actually had a lot of experience in business when I was at school, and I'd done my business and my economics um, exams a year early and did fantastically in them. I was managing director of a company called Young Enterprise, which is like, it's like almost like a, a trial company that you do when you're in school. And I had all of this business experience and then decided to go and study engineering, which was completely random because it was what I thought that I should do. My dad really encouraged me to do that. But after spending some time in Australia when I was 17 or 18, I completely changed my career path and I decided that I wanted to go into psychology. And the reason for that was because I really saw the value in helping people and helping people through doing something that you loved. And my partner at the time was a professional cricket player and he was seeing a sports psychologist himself. And I remember he came back from his session one day and he said to me, Nick, I've had this awesome session. And I said, what, what happened? And he said, well, the guy got me to lie down on a couch, as they do, and he got me to visualize what the best possible scenario would be when I was out on the cricket pitch and to bat. And he said, make sure that when you are looking around you, that you don't look for those fielders that are standing in your way, but you look for the gaps in between the fielders instead. So I really took that and I, I just had this huge mindset shift in that we can apply that to our own lives as well, because it's really easy to look for what's going wrong in your life and business and to focus on and worry about that. But what we actually need to do is look for the opportunities and look for the gaps and the ways through instead. So from that, I changed my degree path and I decided to study psychology with sport. And then I went on to study positive psychology because I realized what I loved is helping people go from where they are right now to where they want to be and really understand what it takes to be a flourishing, thriving and optimally functioning human. So in positive psychology, we look at what it is that actually makes you better in yourself, but we also look at businesses as well. So we look at what goes well in teams, what goes well in communities, and what goes well when we work together as a unit to actually grow something that is bigger than ourselves. So that was kind of the foundation. And I still had this desire, this almost like this little niggling intuitive feeling inside of me that knew that I was meant to run a business. So now I can't imagine ever going back to being told when to go to work or what to do. Um, and I'm so used to the flexibility that being an entrepreneur provides. So as soon as I graduated from my master's degree, I actually launched my first business. And at the time, it was a business that kind of collected all of my favorite things in one place and it made a business out of it. So it was a wellness company called Optimal You. And within that, it did motivational events, it had coaching, and it also had a supplements arm to the business. And I still actually have this now and people still buy the products and I still run the events around the world. But coaching became much more my passion and much more my focus. 
And I realized that by focusing on one thing and doing it really, really well, you can actually experience more success. <laughs> I love that. In a day, what, an age where we kind of have that FOMO and that squirrel syndrome of going from one thing to the next and realizing that there comes a point in time where you have to decide to, to focus on one thing and really do it well. How did you decide that the coaching versus the supplements was for you? Um, I think it was looking at how I was working and how it was making me feel. So I was working really long hours. I mean, I still do work long hours because I love what I do, but I was working long hours and it was making me feel horrible. And I was pushing myself so hard and I wasn't actually getting the results that I wanted, but I was almost trapped in this framework that I'd created and I'd built for myself and I was just going through the motions and one month I would have a 10k month and then the next month I would make $500 and it was this cycle of boom or bust all of the time and that's not good in a business and it's not good within yourself as well so I felt like I was on this emotional roller coaster all of the time and I just needed to get off so I decided that for me, one of the, the big things that I wanted to do was to write a book. And I'd gone through a lot of personal healing and done a lot of um, spiritual work, a lot of subconscious work, a lot of, I had massive commitment to working on myself. And through that, I'd really evolved as a person. And I decided this book was going to be part of that journey so that I could help other people through what I'd learned but I've always been a fan of the sunshine. So I decided I didn't want to write the book in Newcastle, which is where I'm from in England, where it's quite often gray and rainy, unfortunately. And I decided that I wanted to go to Australia. So I packed my suitcase, I sold my car, I moved out of my apartment. So it was literally like, universe, I'm here, I'm ready, I'm doing this. I was terrified. I remember having to unpack my suitcase at the airport because I had so much stuff that I was trying to take with me. I had to give it to my dad. And I remember him picking up my bag of crystals and he said, what on earth are you taking rocks with you for, Nicola? <laughs> so I handed my dad my crystals and off I went. Um, so it was a major relaunch of myself. It was a relaunch of my brand because it really elevated the brand, being somewhere that was sunny, having palm trees. I really stepped into myself in terms of um, owning the colors in my branding and decided that I was going to launch an online coaching program as well. So it was at that time that I really saw the transformation in who I am, but also in what I do and the results that it creates as well. And so that's, I believe that's when we met you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you moved to Australia. Two months after that. Yeah. Okay. And so you were about three years into business at that point in time decided to take yourself out of this current situation, put you somewhere where you really thrived and kind of rebrand. And so when you did that transition into the coaching and over to Australia, did you find that the ups and downs of the roller coaster financially kind of settled down because you now had a purpose and a sole purpose or how, what does that look like? Um, when I first started, it was actually more down than up because I'd gone over to the other side of the world with a hope and a dream. And I had a plan, but the plan didn't end up working out. So what I know now is that launching a coaching business, it's easier to sell one-on-one -on -one coaching straight away than it is to sell to a large group. But I didn't know this and I'd created this awesome group program that just didn't sell. So I went into panic mode and what am I doing? Why am I here? And really did a lot of soul searching during that time. And I hired my first coach and that's how we met. And I really worked on myself and I worked on my mission and I worked on my purpose. And from there, I was able to create fantastic financial success because I had the business model, right? But also because I had the belief in myself that I could actually do exactly what I wanted to do and make amazing money from it. I mean, when I first left the UK, I wouldn't even say that I was a positive psychologist. I was scared to own that title and own that part of myself, even though I'd studied for years to do that. But it felt like I didn't have the confidence and nobody knew what it was. So I just wouldn't share it with people. So it was a big step up to really 
getting visible with that and getting out there. Yeah. I love that you're saying, you know, the, the personal side is so important. It goes hand in hand. You know, there's that, I don't know who started the same, but they always say the entrepreneurship is the biggest personal growth mm -hmm. journey that you'll ever have. And I have found that with myself, it just gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And there's so many ways to broaden your mind and your horizon. And, you know, you kind of start off with the business and you get into the mindset and then you get into the neurological side and it just gets deeper and deeper and you uncover stuff from childhood. And it, it's so fascinating to me as you, as you grow in your business that you really do grow as a person. Absolutely. So I love that you said, I just took, went back to the table and went and really looked at your purpose and what was lying underneath. Um, I would love to hear how you, once you transitioned into the coaching side of things, how did you start to get that visibility that you've, you know, created for yourself and, you know, your, your presence online in a really authentic way, you're speaking all over the world. You have this, you know, this book coming out, this, is it this spring still? It's coming out in August, so it's oh, okay. August 8th that it comes out. It was supposed to be out last week, but the edit, we couldn't get the awesome editor that we wanted, so it's been pushed back a little bit. But that's good, because more space is always good. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so let's dive into getting visible and getting, because you, you transitioned from, okay, I went from Newcastle to Australia, I rebranded. Now I feel good about where I'm at. I have a coach, I'm, I'm coaching. And, and you went with the one-on-one -on -one coaching versus the groups because that was a lot easier to fill. And so from there, what was your journey? What did you start with? So I did a lot of content. Like I've always had a big commitment to creating value for people. So I've always been a hard worker and I've had that work ethic and that desire to create things. So when I'd, I'd launched my one-on-one -on -one practice and then I really wanted to grow it from that stage, I had a huge focus on, right, okay, so what can I actually get out there on the front end for people? And I wish I'd written this down before I um, came on here today because I hope I can remember it all. I was doing on a weekly basis, one blog on my website, a guest blog on somebody else's website, I was um, emailing or getting in touch with 12 different podcasts and I was recording at least two podcasts with people every week. I was doing a boosted post every week. Every single week I would launch a new Facebook funnel because at this stage I wasn't really into online marketing so I didn't know who my audience were so I wanted to practice and get really good at it. So every week I would launch a new funnel. I would do posts on my personal page. I would do an Instagram post daily. And when I added it up, it was 13 different things that I was doing every single week. And that was all on-brand content that can help people. So I've, with my social media, I'm actually a huge introvert, believe it or not. And I, I love closing the door on the world. And I find it actually quite difficult to take photos of myself. I'm like, oh, really again, here we go. So, but you would never know that from the outside looking in because I always push myself to do it because I think the message that I have to share is more important than the, than the fear that I feel. So it's so important to remember when you are getting visible or if you are ever nervous about getting visible, it's not about you. It's about the value that your business can create. And if you're not out there and people can't see you, then how on earth can they be helped by you? So it's a big shift in your mindset to be able to, to, to do that and push through that. <laughs> I, I love this because before we started the, the live portion of this, we were talking about just getting visible and that a lot of people in our community have a hard time around that. Mm. And I have found that a lot of entrepreneurs, I don't know who you've interacted with, but I have found that a lot of entrepreneurs are in fact introverts. Mm -hmm. And so from the outside looking in, like you said, you would never really know that but it does make us really stand up and say, okay, what do I need to do for the people in my community? It's about them. It's not about me so much. At least yeah. that's where I come from because I have a really hard time around um, visibility and posting on social as well. Mm -hmm. So 
what was your first step in making that transition? You, you, you had all these reach outs and you were posting. Um, I mean, that's a lot of content to create and do in a week. Was this just you as a solopreneur? Did you get help in this? That was literally just me. I think at the time I'd maybe just hired my first VA, but even now when I create content, it's still always me. I'm still the voice of the brand. And I'm sure there'll come a time when I find someone awesome that can take my notes or take my voice notes and can create my voice. But for now, I feel like it's really important that I continue to connect with my community on that really powerful level. So I still write the content for the social media calendar that my team then upload for me. I still write the blogs that someone else then uploads for me. I still write the email sequences that my marketing team then create into funnels for me. So everything that's written or spoken within the business, videos obviously have to be me, um, that side of things still comes from my inspirations and my knowledge and learnings and, and insights. And so, you know, looking at from the outside in, you look like you have a very balanced life. You mm -hmm. do yoga and you have a lot of friend time and you're traveling a lot. What does your typical day look like? <laughs> wake, wake up at 5.15, go to spinning, come home, have breakfast, and then go to bed at nine o'clock. Because <laughs> recently I've, um, so the book edits, in, it's in edit at the moment. So there's been a lot of things that I've been clearing off my plate. So I've been on a real mission and I can be really productive when I put my mind to it. Um, I am conscious that that's not the best way to work though. So the things that I love to do in my day, I love to get up early. Like I've always been an early bird and I love that time when everybody else is still asleep and you feel like you're getting ahead of the game. So I get up at 5.15, I'll do some morning ritual um, just in my bedroom, in my bed, it'll be a meditation. I'll do some writings of gratitude. I'll do a visualization and I'll read through my goals. I then get up and I'll go to a spin class or I'll go and work out with my trainer, come home, have breakfast, and I'll start work at 8 a.m. So depending on what day it is, I'm big on batching things. So Tuesdays and Thursdays are always my client facing days. I'll do interviews, I'll speak with my one-on-one -on -one clients, I'll run webinars. And that really works well for me because I'm in the, the speaking mode. I'm in the let's focus on this person that I'm speaking to right now and give them as much as I possibly can to help them. Then on Wednesdays, I'm in content creation mode. So that's when I'll film videos, that's when I'll batch write blogs because I know that doing one thing and focusing on it is a lot more effective than trying to do 10 things in your day and doing them badly. Um, Mondays and Fridays are usually a little bit more flexible. So Fridays is the day where I like to go to yoga. I like to have an easier day. Maybe I'll go for a facial or a massage because I'm big on self-care. And because I work so hard, it's also important to have those replenishing times put into the week. Whilst they might not come into my day every single day, they definitely feature in my week somewhere. Um, evenings, I always I tend to finish work around 7.30 at night. Always make sure now I get my food delivered. So that really helps as well, being an entrepreneur, not to have to think about what to eat. Um, and then weekends, I'll usually have a one day off. One day off a week. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> my guard dog is freaking out. Sounds right in the deal. <laughs> my, uh, <laughs> she's working hard at the front. <laughs> guard dog. <sighs> Sorry about that. So, um, thank you for breaking it down. You know, I I was just at a conference this weekend. Brendan Burchard's uh, High Performance Academy. Oh, were you? Awesome. Yeah. And you know, he was talking about a wonderful practice because you know, we, we're very similar. We're, we work hard. We, we, uh, but we also take time off and we, we travel and, mm -hmm. and have holiday and, and rejuvenate. And he was saying that when he time blocks, he does a little transition meditation. Yeah. Which I thought was so interesting yeah. to really set the intention for that time block because mm -hmm. 
if you are just going throughout your day and you're just, it kind of feels like you're pushing, pushing, pushing mm -hmm. through things versus actually being intentional and being thoughtful and giving yourself a little break, just a little break in between things. Yeah. I know he's really big on, cause I work with Brendan as well and he's really big on breathing as well in these breaks. It's the things that you forget to do when you're on autopilot and not many of us take a pause in our day just to take some really deep breaths. And it really affects the way that you feel, but also helps you be better in your business as well. Right. Yeah. I love that. I, I yeah, we did all the breathing and the tapping and the, <laughs> and the energy stuff. Cause that's really, um, I found after four solid days that I had a lot of energy when I got home on Sunday, just from being in that space. And then Monday was energetic and like the, the next day I was just, exhausted. Yeah. Finally hit, you know, and that's a good reminder. Like you said, on Fridays, it's a self care day because you've been mm -hmm. pushing through and really showing up fully and then taking that time to just relax. Yeah. Step back. Yes. Okay. So let's dive into another portion of your business where you're really putting yourself out there. You were doing all these blogs, podcasts, content creation, but how did this book come about? So the book, I've wanted to write a book for a long time, but the book originally was going to be a textbook because I have, I like, I was an academic and I am an academic at heart. I'm really interested in the science. So I'd written theoretical papers and things. And I thought, I really want to write a book about positive psychology that teaches people the science. But because I went through such a, a healing in my personal world, I realized that there's much more story to add to the science to actually support it. So the book developed into a, a blend of the science and the spirituality and really brings together my personal experience with my professional expertise as a psychologist and as an entrepreneur to give the reader almost like their, their own roadmap to thriving in life. So it's a 30 day guide to living your happiest life using positive psychology. And there's a tool or a teaching every single day for 30 days. When I started the book, I had gone to the Hay House Writers Workshop in London and it was originally a 12 chapter book. And I'd gone to the workshop, I'd had an awesome experience, I'd had loads of synchronicities that were happening on that day. And you know when you feel like something's really meant for you and you're in the right place at the right time, I had that real empowering intuitive feeling and knowing that this book was the right thing to be doing. I then moved across to Australia to write and planned it all out. And I thought, I'm going to write 2,000 words a day, I'm going to write for eight hours a day. I'm going to write on this thing on this day, this thing on this day. And I started writing and I was writing and it was essentially like a textbook. It was boring. <laughs> so I, I kind of stepped back from that and I went and I lived my life and I experienced Australia and I, I really allowed that inspiration and intuitive thought and flow to come through and ended up writing a much better book as a result because when you overthink something, it's actually coming from your head and not from your heart. So I completely changed the structure of the book for a start and changed it into the 30 day guide because I know that we're all busy and sometimes it's hard to read a book. So giving you a, a two page tool every day is a lot easier for you to digest it and apply it into your life. So when I was in Australia, I actually decided that I wanted to write this book and to be part of the Hay House family so much that I was going to go to the Australia's Writers' Workshop as well. And with each workshop, you have the opportunity to submit a proposal to Hay House and it's a competition on who wins. So I thought, let's enter twice and I have two chances. So I entered both um, Writers' Workshops. And then I was waiting and waiting and waiting for the announcement date. And it was in January. So I went to the writer's workshop in March. I moved to Australia in June. I submitted the proposal in November. And then it was January before I found out. And I was sitting in the house and I thought, okay, we're quite a few hours ahead of England. So they'll, it'll be later in the day. And I remember I was watching a movie with my friend and I, I had my phone next to me and it wasn't ringing. 
I was like, when are they going to ring me to tell me that I've won this? Because <laughs> I've been doing so much meditation and visualization and quantum leaping into being a Hay House author. I had post-it notes on my mirror. I was telling everyone I'm going to be a Hay House author before I'd even won the competition. So in my, inside of myself, I already felt like I was that. And that's what you find with business and with success. It's not just the success that you create, but it's who you actually become in the process as well. So they didn't end up bringing me. They ended up sending me an email because they weren't sure about the time difference. So I checked my emails and I said to my friend, Helen, I said, oh my God, I've done it. I've done it. And she said, done what, babe? She was busy watching the movie. And I was like, I've won my book deal. And then we <laughs> dance around, dance around the, the living room. And I called Hay House and I screamed down the phone and they put me on the speaker. And they were like, just do that again so the whole office can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> and that was only the beginning. I thought kind of getting the book deal was the hard part. But then I had to write the book. I'm now going through the edit. You've got to market the book. It's a, it's a completely different ball game to anything that I've ever done before. It's a huge, huge project, but it's really fulfilling as well. <laughs> I love that you, <laughs> they had you <laughs> re-emphasize your joy. Yeah. <laughs> Do it again. <laughs> Scream for us again. <laughs> I love that. What a wonderful mm -hmm. way to really solidify your dreams and your, and manifesting that. So as a positive psychologist, is it, well, give us a better explanation of what positive psychology is. Because I never really actually heard about positive psychology until I met you. Mm. I always heard psychology. So with the positive psychology, are you, is that part of the manifesting and the getting into alignment and flow and all of that and positive affirmations? Yeah, flow is a big part of PodPsych and meditation and mindfulness and spirituality is a big part of PodPsych. But what PodPsych does is it actually takes all of these awesome concepts and it does the research to prove that they work and why they work. So whilst we have always known about things like gratitude, you're always told by your grandparents and your parents, say thanks, be grateful. We now know why. And we now know how you can implement that thing in your life to actually increase your well-being and to make you better. The difference with psychology as usual is that psychology as usual used to, and still does, focus mainly on disorder and disease. And it focuses on what goes wrong with people rather than on what goes right. So in the year 2000, positive psychology was developed as the counterpart to that to not say that psychology is wrong, but to just balance it out and to look at human strength and virtue instead. So it's fantastic to be able to work in such a, such a capacity that helps people so much, but also it's like personal development for me because I get to practice all of these tools on myself as well. <laughs> I love that. I think honestly, if I were going back to university or, you know, talking to myself back in that time, I think I would go for the positive psychology. You should still do it. I, yeah, I should still do it. I would love to do it. I love knowing the science behind the gratitude, the manifesting, mm -hmm. all of that. Absolutely. So excited about it in this, at this point in my life. So, all right, let's dive into the, the speaking engagements that you got. And, and, you know, every time I talk to you, you're, you're going to a different country and you're, you know, bopping here and there. I thought I traveled a lot and I traveled <laughs> hardly ever <laughs> compared to you. So I would love to hear more about your, you know, is there a strategy of why you're doing this? Is it to do speaking engagements? Is it uh, just to take yourself out of out of the norm and, and kind of work on a project somewhere. What does this travel do for you in your business? So the travel is always, always, always for the business. When I look at the last vacation I had, I actually don't remember when, when it was. So that's something that I'm working on my coach with to actually plan in more vacations where I don't go and speak or do, do work things. Um, the speaking has always been my main passion. It's what I started my first business, the motivational events that I did. It was because I loved to stand up and speak. And whilst I say it's always been my main passion, it wasn't like that from when I was a kid. It used to be the thing that I was most scared of. 
And I remember being asked to read in school and I would sit and I would worry about the book coming around. You know, when the, past, the, the teacher says, pass the book around and everyone reads a paragraph. I used to sit there and be like, please, please, please don't let it come to me. I don't want to read out loud in front of the class. I really hated standing up and doing talks, but because I hated it so much, I made it my, I was so determined to not let that stop me. So I purposefully threw myself into it. And I asked my teacher for more help. I said, tell me how to be an awesome speaker. Tell me how to stand up and talk. I set up a debating society in sixth form and I spoke in European Youth Parliament. So I completely flipped that around, but that was only through hard work and intention. Now, in terms of the speaking that I do, I started running my own events, which was great. And it was on a small scale. It allowed me to test my material. It brought me some income, but not a lot. But it allowed me to build up my community. So my first mailing list actually came from my speaking events that I'd ran. So I had, when I launched my online coaching business and the one-on-one, I had a mailing list of 580 people. And those 580 people were from speaking. So it, it's, it's fulfilling in the sense that you get to go and share your message, but it also helps you to build a good foundation for your business as well. So from there, I mean, now I've spoken in New Zealand, I've spoken in Australia, Dubai, Miami, Hollywood. I've spoken all around the world, Amsterdam, London, like loads and loads and loads of places. And it's different every time. So what you need to remember with speaking is that it's not always that you're going to say, okay, my fee is $5,000 for an hour and I want you to book me business class flights and that's the only way that I'm going to do it. Sometimes you'll show up and you'll speak for free, but you will be able to gain email subscribers. You'll be able to offer your products at the end of your talk or you'll be able to promote your services. So you have to think about what the trade-off between the value that you give and the result that you want to create is. So think about why you're doing it. Are you doing it to practice your skills and share your material? Are you doing it to grow your list? Are you doing it to sell something? Or are you doing it because you want to be a paid speaker? And there's everything in between. So I think it's about thinking about what is the purpose of the speaking for you and then deciding where would be a good fit for you to speak. Oh, I love all these tips. Thank you so much for breaking that down. We get a lot of questions. Uh, It's nerve wracking, like you said, to just even speak in front of an audience. But, you know, starting small and looking at the outcome, you know, getting a few email addresses, Mm -hmm. getting known in your local community, first and foremost, could be a good good place to start. Mm -hmm. I have a question around when you said that they were passing the book around and you didn't want to read out loud and you went to your teacher how old were you i was in high school so i was probably 13 14 15 mm-hmm. and it was only in those later stages of sixth form that i decided to change things around so for me it's, it's always been self-expression so this visibility thing this speaking thing this having a voice that's been my challenge both within myself and within my business. And you would never know it now because I stand up on stage in front of 2000 people and it's the easiest thing because I feel like it flows through me and I don't even need to plan and prepare. I can just stand up there and speak now. So for anyone that's struggling with speaking, I'd just say like practice, 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 get out there, do meetups. Meetups are fantastic service. You could run an event in your local community People are always wanting to go and experience something to network. So it's a perfect opportunity to get practice in. Oh, thank you. That's a great idea. For those of you who are nervous about this or shy about sharing your voice, even just talking to a few people in your local community at a meetup is a wonderful way to to try on your voice and, and to realize that you do have something to share with the world and that people do want to hear from you. Thank you for sharing those tips, Nick. Of course. So I would love to ask you, what is the one thing you wish you would have known when you launched into the online portion of your journey? I wish I'd known at the start that the more yourself you are, the easier it will be. 
So as I've grown into my voice and as I've got more comfortable with sharing the bad parts, the, the things that go wrong, as well as the good parts, it's actually been easier. And I get so many emails back from my mailing list now saying, oh my goodness, I feel like this too, or this happened to me, or thank you so much. And before I was too scared to, to show that vulnerability, I was looking for people that I could copy and people that I could say, okay, maybe I could sound like that, or maybe I could share that message. And it's because I wasn't confident in myself. So focus on building yourself and building the belief in yourself and your message and your voice to a point where you feel like you can share that little bit more. And just every time, just go that little bit extra and that little bit extra. And now you'll get to the point where you feel like you can share anything and it will be so well received. It's, it's an amazing thing to be able to wake up and run your business and just be yourself. <laughs> I think that is such a good lesson. I, I, think, that, I think you just spoke directly to me. <laughs> <laughs> it is something that I have heard for probably the last three, three months is just be yourself, share your voice, share you. And I, you know, because Lindsay and I have co-founded Get It Done Gals, I'm on the back end building all the systems and the sales funnels and all the online stuff. And she's been the community director and out in the mm. local community and doing the Facebook lives and, and sharing on Instagram. And, you know, someone finally stepped up and said, Hey, a lot of people are not able to connect with you and you're this co-founder and you need to step up and share your voice and you need to be you in front of all these people. And I had never really thought about that. You know, I just thought, Oh, we're building this brand together and we show up together on webinars and all of that. But, you know, I really, I loved getting that feedback about uh, around me showing up and just being myself and sharing because my perspective is going to be different from her perspective. We've had different journeys. So thank you for sharing that. Cause that's and because you're awesome, Nicole. <laughs> and because you, I want to see you. So awesome. I'm excited to see more of you. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. I appreciate it. Um, all right. So is there anything that you want to share that we haven't talked about in this conversation today for our ladies in the community around their life or business? I don't think so. Is there any questions that anybody has that I can help with at all that have come in? Uh, let me just do a quick check. I'm totally happy to answer any questions. I think it's really an interesting process for me as well to be asked these questions because we don't always reflect on our own experiences of business and our own journey. So it gives me insight into, oh, actually, I did that because of that reason and that happened. So it's been fantastic to be asked these questions. Thank you. Yeah, yeah no, we appreciate it. You, um, no, the, the questions were mainly around the speaking engagement, the book deals. Um, the other question that um, someone had asked was around meeting influencers, you know, coming from that place of, okay, I'm just starting to grow my business and I'm looking at all the things I need to do and being nervous about making the connections that we need to make. Like you said, you reached out to podcasts and guest blog. You know, how, how did you go about really uh, connecting with people as you were just starting out? Well, I just did it. And I had the mindset that everybody that has some sort of platform, so people that have podcasts, people that have blogs, they're always looking for things to share. It's actually really difficult to maintain a podcast and to make sure that you have new content all of the time. So a lot of these podcasts do welcome guests on. So when I reached out to them and I sent them a bit of background about what I was doing, about my business, about my mission in the world, and looked at how I could actually serve their communities and thought, right, this would be a good match. Rather than sending it out to just anyone, I looked at who would be a good match. And then getting in touch with them, they were always really responsive. And they said, yes, awesome. I'm looking for some new content on the show. And I think that's a really good mindset switch to have, whether it's a, I mean, a, a newspaper 
a journalist, they're always, always, always looking for content. So you're actually helping them. So get into that mindset and it becomes a lot easier. When it comes to things like influencers and JVs and setting up um, those type of partnerships, I would definitely remember to look to work with people who have the same audience as you. So you want to work with people who have the same audience but a different skill set. So you end up actually balancing strengths and weaknesses by offering something that's unique to that audience that can be supported by what it is that you have to give. Great tips. Thank you so much for sharing. So you have a, uh, is it a monthly membership site where you give a lot of these tips and tools and is it for people who are entrepreneurs or not entrepreneurs? Can you tell us more about your membership? Yes, absolutely. So the, the membership is called the Now Is Your Chance VIP Society and it's a monthly membership which helps you to create success faster. So in there at the moment, there's three different modules. There's um, goal setting and manifestation. There's also how to energize your success because you'll know being a high performer is all about consistently being able to maintain that energy. Then there's a module about productivity and time management. And I'm just working on the content for April, which is all about confidence and self-belief. So the Nick VIP Society is $29 a month. And I absolutely love creating all of the content in there. <laughs> All right. So when uh, we create the blog post, we'll put the link and we'll put the link below in the comments below awesome. this video. Thank you. So that, yes, of course. That's so kind. Nice surprise. And mm -hmm. you also have a Facebook group. Now is your chance. Is that correct? So everything's under the Now is Your Chance brand. That's the name of the book. It also is, stands for my name, N-I-Y-C, which I didn't change my name to make it Now is Your Chance, but the, the idea for the book title came in and I was like, oh, it's actually my name. Um, so yeah, Now is Your Chance group, totally free. There's 4,000 female entrepreneurs in there at the moment. Perfect. And this is for someone who may not be in entrepreneurship or is, does have their own business. It can be, no, they can be a, um, a business owner, not a business owner. There's women in there that don't have a business at all, but they just like that. They like to work on the happiness. They like to work on the inner success and look and learn from and be motivated by everyone else in the group as well. Wonderful. I'm in the group, you guys. It's wonderful. There's always great content in there and it's always great to connect and, and meet other women who are working on their them, themselves, you know, and really mm -hmm. coming from that place of happiness and, and true joy versus the outside things that might make us happy for just a second in time. So thank you so much for being here, Nick. We really appreciate it. And we'll give you all the details in the comments below and in the blog post. Amazing. Thank you for having me. See you later, guys. <laughs>